the Center on Irregular Warfare and Armed Groups at the Naval War College in the United States. I'm going to be chairing this panel that looks at Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India and the Islamic challenges uh, to South Asia. Well, we have a very uh, prestigious panel here, and let me just give very, very brief uh, introductions to each one of our panelists in order. Uh, Dr. Sajan Gahol is the International Security Director of the Asia Pacific Center in the UK. Uh, professor Timothy Hoyt is a Professor of Strategy and Policy and the John Nicholas Brown Chair of Counterterrorism at the United States Naval War College in the US. Major General Ash Ashok Amata is the former General Officer Commanding Indian Peacekeeping Forces in Sri Lanka. Next. We have uh, Mr. Jonathan Paris, who is the senior advisor of the Chertoff Group in the UK. He's running a bit le late, but uh, he does sit, supposed to be sitting at the end over there. And finally, and certainly not least, or last but certainly not least, is the Com Commander Roy Vincent Trinidad, who is the chief of the administration division and assistant division chief of manpower and organization division of the Joint Staff for Operations of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. With that, that let me start with our first um, speaker, uh, Dr. Jadan Gahal. on time, so Q&A, uh, so I will try my best. So my focus is on South Asia and the terrorism connections linking back to the <coughs> West and uh, also to uh, Israel, and mostly focus when I talk about the West to Europe, Great Britain and the, and the mainland. Uh, so let's just start. I mean, South Asia, as some of you are aware, very complex, intractable conflicts, so there are insurgencies, direct conflicts, uh, very diverse problems. We've seen a whole array of different entities emerge in the last many years, pre-9-11, post-9-11, and in many ways, the problem doesn't seem to be uh, stopping. A lot of the focus of all the problems seems to be uh, directed at what emanates outside uh, Pakistan. Now, we should make this point clear that even though the problems do start in Pakistan, there is a separation that is taking place between the civilian government and the military. We can't hold the civilian government responsible for a lot of the criticism that the country faces, predominantly because the military in Pakistan has played a very, well, let's say dubious role with the extremists that exist inside the country. In the UK, we've seen a direct linkage with problems of terrorism in Pakistan back to uh, Great Britain. Our former Prime Minister, Vaughan Brown, had mentioned in 2008 that three quarters of the most serious plots uh, had a direct connection with AQ in Pakistan. We know also that every year there are some 400,000 visits by British citizens of Pakistani origin who stay in Pakistan for about 41 days. Majority of them are going for purely legitimate purposes. They're not going there for spreading violence or extremism. They go on holidays. They go to spend time with their relatives. Some may go even to get married. Unfortunately, within that statistic, there is that small portion of people that are going very specifically for radicalization and for terrorism. We saw a problem developing uh, in terms of the terrorism nexus with the UK before 9-11. Uh, Mohammed Bilal was perhaps the first example. Uh, not commonly known, but he has the unfortunate uh, distinction of being Britain's first suicide bomber. He had been recruited by the Kashmir-based group, uh, Jama uh, Jeshi Muhammad, um, and uh, was a suicide bomber in uh, Christmas Day 2000, attacking an Indian army barracks in Indian administered Kashmir. We also saw post 9-11 a 
Britons traveling to uh, Pakistan for terrorist training. Uh, this is an interesting case because many of you probably know of Richard Reed. Not many people necessarily know of uh, his co-conspirator, Sajid Badat. On the day that Richard Reed was supposed to carry out his attack, of blowing up a, a US bound flight from Paris, uh, Sajid Badat was supposed to do the same thing from a flight leaving Amsterdam Schiphol Airport. We know what happened to Richard Reed. He was apprehended by his fellow passengers and he was prosecuted. Sajid Badat, one week before the plot, actually chickened out. He uh, wrote to his handler and told him he doesn't want to go ahead. Eventually, through investigations and through cooperation with various law enforcement agencies, they managed to track down Badat. And what they found, which was very interesting, was that the piece of cord that was attached to Richard Reed's shoe was the same piece of cord that was also attached to the device that Sajid Badat had. He'd left it underneath his bed, hoping no one would ever notice. Uh, the common factor also was that they were directly handled by Nizat Trabelzi, a uh, Belgian national of Tunisian origin. Another person who gained some notoriety was Ahmed Omar Syed Sheikh, a uh, very well-educated individual, came from a good middle-class background. His family were quite prosperous in the rag trade. Um, he studied at London School of Economics. Uh, he had spent time in jail in uh, Indian-administered Kashmir and then was eventually released following the hijacking of an Indian Airlines flight uh, when the Indian government gave in to the demands of the hijackers. He ended up joining the uh, Jama, sorry, the Jeshi Muhammad terrorist group and was then eventually involved in the abduction and then the brutal uh, beheading of uh, US uh, journalist uh, Daniel Pearl. Um, so there were these very prominent examples taking place. And then we had some strange examples. So for example, Asif Mohammed Hanif and Omar Khan Sharif. These two individuals actually enlisted with uh, Hamas uh, and uh, they traveled to Israel and uh, one of them uh, blew themselves up outside uh, a cafe in Tel Aviv, Mike's place. The other one, his device failed. Eventually, a few days later, he was found washed ashore uh, on, on the beachfront. Uh, allegedly, he committed suicide, but no one knows. But this was kind of an in unusual example because we'd often seen people of Pakistani origin traveling to Pakistan for terrorist-related purposes. This time, you had an example of two individuals going to Israel country in which they had no real connection with uh, whatsoever. What we then began to see from 2004 onwards was a whole spate of Al-Qaeda based terrorist plots directly targeting the UK repeatedly on a consistent basis. So one of the first was the ammonium nitrate plot uh, which involved uh, these uh, five individuals who had in their possession half a ton of ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And they were planning to carry out a number of attacks uh, on nightclubs, electricity stations, uh, football stadiums, um, and they were certainly trained and they were certainly prepared. And fortunately, because of the authorities having got wind of their operation, they were able to disrupt it. And each one of these individuals faced very hefty sentences. There was another cell linked to uh, Diran Barat. Diran Barat, very interesting individual. He was a convert to Islam. Uh, Again, he came from a very well-to-do family. He was educated. Even mentioned in the 9-11 Commission report, he was one of the few people that kind of uh, interlinked the whole pre-9-11, post-9-11 generation of terrorists. And he'd recruited a large number of individuals. And they had a plot of uh, targeting uh, a tunnel in the London Underground using uh, uh, an explosive packs uh, limousine. They were even looking at uh, carrying out um, uh, a dirty bomb. Uh, an RDD, and they were even scouting out targets in the United States, uh, commercial buildings in uh, Washington, and also uh, in New York and Newark. Again, the plot was disrupted. One that unfortunately wasn't disrupted was the 2005 uh, attacks on the 7th of July, uh, when four British suicide bombers, uh, three blew up uh, their devices on trains, the other on a bus, killing uh, 52 people. And that, I think, was one of those examples which uh, in many ways left deep, indelible scars on British society, especially as it happened the day after London was awarded the Olympic Games. We had then the plot two weeks later, which uh, was now, it's believed, to be directly coordinated by the same group of, in Pakistan by al-Qaeda to try and hit the UK repeatedly over and over again. 
This time, the devices failed. The plotters had left their explosive devices near a radiator, and it actually degraded. So they didn't have the ability to detonate uh, with the explosive device as successfully as the 7-7 bombers had. What's interesting, though, about these guys is that all of them are predominantly uh, from originally the, the Horn of Africa, Somali, Ethiopian, Eritrean, not Pakistani or Pakistani origin. The other cases I mentioned to you were all people predominantly of Pakistani extraction. This time you had individuals who'd gone to Pakistan but had no direct lineage or connection uh, to the country. Uh, then we had the, the, the liquid bomb plot, which if, had it, if it had succeeded, potentially could have been as devastating as 9-11 because these individuals were planning to blow up uh, uh, several flights heading to the United States and Canada uh, and do it over a synchronized period of time. So it would have been catastrophic. Uh, and these individuals had chemicals and pos possessed, possessed uh, the know-how to basically, at the time, bypass airport security. Again, this was disrupted largely thanks to cooperation from uh, law enforcement in both the UK, the United States, and in Pakistan. So these were basically uh, some of the main plots that had a strong connection to uh, Al-Qaeda in Pakistan. And then there was also the beheading plot. It doesn't get much attention, but you had these individuals who were intending to abduct a Muslim British soldier and then film his beheading. Very similar to what we saw in those videos in Iraq uh, of individuals being abducted and then beheaded whilst being filmed. Uh, but this plot was disrupted and these individuals were prosecuted. So with all of these things in mind, you see certain threads, certain chains, certain linkages emerging. And what we saw in many of these plots is that there was a, a handler involved in prepping these guys and training them. Um, and in many ways, this is also why it explains that the, the volume of terrorism violence from Al-Qaeda in the UK is not necessarily at the same level that it potentially once was. So, for example, Abdul Hadi al-Iraqi, an Iraqi national, former member of Saddam Hussein's uh, Fedayeen, uh, he was a trainer, and he was directly connected to the ammonium nitrate uh, plot. Uh, Rashid Rao, who was a British Pakistani, connected to both the 7-7 plot and the airline liquid bomb plot. And also the 7-7 plot was connected to uh, an Egyptian, Abu Ubeda al-Masri, who in turn was coordinating both the 7-7 plot and the 21-7 plot that I mentioned earlier. Now, uh, Abdul Hadi al-Iraqi was arrested by uh, the US military whilst trying to get into Iraq at the end of 2006. Rashid Rauf, we believe, was killed in a drone strike and Abu Beda Masri died from hepatitis. So three people who were very much key to training Britons and prepping them basically were no longer on the scene. But I think what's also important is if you can see where the Britons were actually being trained. And I think it, you can basically just about see it, coloring sorry isn't the greatest, but so for example, the airline liquid bomb plot was in South Waziristan. Um, the 7-7 the seven, seven plot uh, was in Mansera, on the top there. And uh, the ammonium nitrate plot, some of those guys had traveled to uh, Kohat in the south and Swat. So it was spread. It wasn't like focused on one region. There's often this obsession in saying that Al-Qaeda is training its people in the tribal areas. Yes, there is, of course, a very strong viable presence there. But it's not just in the tribal areas. And I mean... I just ask you to pay attention to that uh, one in pink, Mansera, because I'm going to come back to that a little later. Uh, the Duran Barat cell was purely based in, in the Punjab province of Pakistan, in uh, the town of uh, Gujarat and in Lahore. Lahore is the cultural center of Pakistan. But unfortunately, over the last few years, it's, it's seen a lot of violence taking place, and in many ways, it's become a safe haven now for, for extremists. Um, in uh, Pakistan, Kashmir, we saw the fact that the 21-7 plotters and the beheading plotters were in, in Mirpur. And even the ammonium nitrate plotters had spent time in Muzrafabad, which is the administrative capital of Pakistan, Kashmir. So I guess, again, you can see that these weren't in the tribal areas, these weren't in the sticks. A lot of them were being trained in urban centers. And maybe 
why should that even be a surprise to us? Look at where the senior leadership of Al-Qaeda was being picked up in, uh, whether it was Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Rawalpindi or uh, Ramzi bin Al-Shiba, Tafik bin Atash in Karachi, uh, Abu Zabaida in Faizlabad. Uh, Rashid Rauf was picked up in Bhualpur. And of course, um, perhaps the most infamous was uh, Osama bin Laden in, in Abbottabad. Um, these things were there for people to see. You didn't need classified intelligence to identify where everyone was being picked up. But for whatever reasons, there was a lot of focus purely on uh, the tribal areas. And I think in hindsight, um, that, that was a mistake. Uh, what's kind of interesting is if you look at some testimony from individuals, uh, Wahid Ali was charged with being connected to the 7-7 plot. He was found innocent and exonerated of all charges. What is interesting is during his court trial, he gave testimony about how he'd gone on a gallivant with uh, one of the 7-7 bombers, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan, and how they'd gone to Mansera to train. At the time, that was more... Kashmir centric against the Indian military. And eventually, some would then get sort of detagged and would join Al Qaeda. But what's interesting about where they're training, as I mentioned to Mansera, look at the district underneath Mansera. It's Abbottabad. Now, people were being trained in a district very nearby where Osama bin Laden is supposed to have been based. I would say that is an issue of concern, an issue that really needs to be, to be addressed. Uh, there are a lot of question marks on Abbottabad that still don't get answered. We know that Osama bin Laden is there. But a senior member of the Southeast Asian terrorist group, uh, Jama Islamiyah, was there, Umar Fatik. Umar Fatik was in Abbottabad at the same time. What about the fact that when bin Laden was supposed to have been first living in Abbottabad, the head of Pakistan's intelligence agency, Lieutenant General Nadim Taj, was in charge. Uh, he was running the academy, and then he became the head of the intelligence agency. And, of course, a lot of focus should also be on uh, General Pervez Musharraf, the, who was the military ruler for many years post 9-11. In fact, Musharraf even mentioned Abbottabad in his autobiography, in which he spoke about that al-Qaeda people were hiding there, including especially Abu Faraj al-Libi. So the fact is the clues were there, I guess, but in many ways... It, we, no one focused on it. And the question also remains as to what role did the Pakistani military ultimately play in, in terms of did, were they aware of bin Laden's whereabouts or were they negligible? Either way, it doesn't sort of bode very well. The question also is focused more on Pakistan's intelligence agency, the, the ISI. Uh, what's interesting is Omar Khayyam. Omar Khayyam, who was part of the liquid bomb plot, sorry, the ammonium nitrate plot, he gave testimony in a court case in the UK when he was being prosecuted, in which he spoke about how he was recruited, how initially he was actually serving as part of um, the, the, the mission to uh, carry out insurgent attacks in Indian administered Kashmir. He then eventually ended up joining Al-Qaeda. What was interesting was his identifying how he'd been recruited by the ISI. Now, if you look at the whole issue of what uh, where recruitment was taking place. There were certain institutions where recruitment was, was happening. There were also uh, certain universities where these individuals had studied. That doesn't mean the universities are centers for terrorism, but it just gives you examples of where they were being educated. Uh, and all of this combined often served as a tool for radicals and extremists. In many ways, there were terrorist groups that acted as the precursor to Al-Qaeda, like the Lashkar-e Toiba, the Jaish e Mohammed, and the Harkot al Mujahideen. Many would then end up joining Al Qaeda. But now maybe we're seeing things taking place in reverse. So, for example, the Lashkar e Toiba is a group that is gaining a lot of attention and traction. They were at one time purely focused on Kashmir and taking it uh, away from uh, Indian control and uniting it. Slowly they've moved, they've developed a far more transnational doctrine. Uh, and a much more wider scope. They practice the Ali Hadith uh, form, uh, uh, which is kind of a South Asian version of Salafism. It's very extreme, it's very aggressive, and it's even opposed to Sunni Muslims who don't uh, necessarily practice it. Um, and it's, it's far more hardcore than Diobandism, which in its pure essence is not radical. 
Um, and over time, what we've seen is that the Lashkari Toiba hasn't just identified the West. They've specifically targeted the US and also Israel as well in terms of their slogans and their doctrine and their agenda. They've been known for carrying out what they call fedayin attacks, attacks where the individuals try and kill as many people as possible and then die in a hail of bullets. They don't believe in suicide missions. So they were behind the attack on the Indian parliament in 2001, the Mumbai siege attack, which we all know about. What was very interesting was how well coordinated that was. This is like a transcript from the, uh, the Jewish uh, cultural center, the Chabad center, uh, Naraman House in Mumbai, when uh, various people were taken hostage. This was Norma Rabinovich, who was basically talking to the handler in, in Pakistan. Um, and what was interesting is how the handler was basically trying to con coordinate and control the situation. In this, he's basically telling her to relax, not to worry, that everything is going to be okay. Within 24 hours, he's telling one of the gunmen to basically kill all the remaining people inside uh, that, uh, that building. Now, some people have been prosecuted, but not everyone connected to that plot has been formally arrested. Some haven't even been formally identified as connected to the LET. The one lo loaning uh, gunman, Ajmal Kassab, who survived, still doesn't know much or is able to provide enough details. If you look at the LET leadership structure, out of the 21 people that are there, only two have actually been formally arrested. Simply not enough. And what that means is, is that the infrastructure of it is very much there and pliable to carry out future attacks. Hafiz Saeed, who is the leader of the LET, is in all likelihood going to go into politics next year and is going to stand as a member of the National Assembly. And he represents the, he's the ideological head of the organization. Also, they have a charitable wing, Fala Insaniyat Foundation, which is being very prevalent in recruiting people and basically indoctrinating young, impressionable minds. They, when there have been terrible natural disasters in Pakistan, this group has often been there distributing aid. So they have a very effective way of winning hearts and minds. And that potentially is dangerous in recruiting young, impressionable people. These are examples of all the LET operations that have taken a place abroad. I won't go into detail, but um, I can discuss them in the Q&A. Also, let's not forget the role of David Headley. Uh, I'm just being warned to conclude, <laughs> sorry. I'll just be a few minutes. Um, David Headley was recruited by the Lascari Toiba to do surveillance, to identify locations in India. He is an American national with uh, of Pakistani origin. So he's the one who scouted the Habad Center. He also uh, was responsible for the plot to target the Yilans Post and newspaper in Denmark, which was the newspaper that had published those controversial cartoons on the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Headley also had done reconnaissance in other parts of India, including the town of Pune. So a couple of years ago, two years after the Mumbai attack, we saw the fact that there had been an attack in Pune at the German bakery which was in very close proximity to another Jewish Chabad center uh, in, the, in the city. So it showed that the LET still had the desire and the ability to target places in India, especially those that may have had a presence, a Jewish presence, a Western presence. Uh, what we're also noticing is that the LET has bases in, uh, in Afghanistan, especially in Kuna and Nuristan. At the moment, it's not really sizable, it's negligible. They're not engaging coalition soldiers, but they are there, and they could use it in the future post-2014 as a base and as a place to operate. Um, what we're also noticing is the fact that drone strikes are containing people who wish to join some of these terrorist groups. So in 2010, there were two major drone strikes in September, which basically eliminated large cells of European Muslims who were being recruited to take part in acts of terrorism in Europe, uh, connected specifically under the base of the Islamic Jihad Union, which is an offshoot of the IMU. Now, the IJU has recruited Turkish Germans, uh, like this person you can see on the map, who was a suicide bomber in Afghanistan, killing US soldiers. They were also behind the Sauland cell, which was a very large cell to target the US Air Force at Ramstein Air Base. Plot was disrupted. And what we're seeing now increasingly is that Germany is catching up with the UK. The large number of individuals are being recruited to take part in acts of terrorism, but to be trained in Pakistan. And we're seeing the number rise every year. So 
sorry, I'm just, just two minutes. Um, also, what's happening is that a lot of converts, not everybody is, uh, say, from South Asia or from Turkey. A lot of the people that they're recruiting are converts, and they're playing a very prominent role because they don't necessarily fit a certain profile. And there are certain regions in Germany where the recruitment is taking place in which people then end up in uh, South Asia. I could go on about the Taliban, but I won't. But uh, basically, that is the other issue that is now creating a problem. That on the one hand, the Pakistani military has created these institutions or created this, this environment which has allowed these terrorist groups to operate in. But the negative side is that there are other entities that are challenging the state and carrying out attacks like the Pakistani Taliban, which has been growing in the ascendancy and been carrying out a lot of attacks. They've even targeted some of uh, Pakistan's nuclear military installations in the past. These are some examples. Um, I could say a lot more, but I won't. But basically, what you're seeing is that the terrorist infrastructure in Pakistan remains in place. Uh, Osama bin Laden may be dead. Al-Qaeda may have suffered some hits. But there are a number of different groups there on the scene that have the means and the ability to plot and plan terrorist attacks. And the problem is not going to go away. Um, there are new groups, as I mentioned. So we have to be aware of them, and we have to be aware of the diversification of the threat. And I will conclude with that. If you have questions or anything, you feel free, and I can, I can send you a more detailed version of my presentation. But I'll conclude. Thank you. Uh, just a bit of news while we were um, on the panel. The U.S. ambassador to Libya has died. Um, after uh, an attack by militiamen on the U.S. consulate in the eastern city of Benghazi. Just thought you might want to know about that as the panel's going on. Stevens? All right. Um, before I begin, I have to issue a disclaimer. Uh, because I am an employee of the U.S. government, it is very important that you know that the very undiplomatic things that I'm about to say are my own opinions. They do not reflect the policy of the United States Navy, the U.S. Naval War College, the Department of Defense, or any other agency of the United States government. I'm here as an analyst. Um, and I will say unpopular things, because what I'm going to talk about is militancy in Pakistan and potential futures for Pakistan based on some realities that exist in the ground. Uh, Dr. Gowell has already said some of the things that I would like to have pointed out, so I will take that opportunity to dance around some of what he said. Uh, let me begin by saying, however, that there is a very, very, very strong argument that can be made that Pakistan is the strongest state supporter of terror in the world today, not Iraq. A 2004 account listed 125 armed jihadist groups in Pakistan. None of them at that time were illegal. Um, Pakistan has used armed jihadist groups as a major element of its foreign policy since independence, beginning in 1947 when it used Pashtun irregulars to invade the, province, uh, the, the then principality of Kashmir, which started a war with India that created a divided Kashmir that still remains a problem today. Pakistan used irregular forces in 1965 again to invade Kashmir. Uh, since the 1970s, Pakistan has regularly been involved through its intelligence network and through the regular army with the use of proxy militant groups in India and in Afghanistan in particular, but they've also been found in Bangladesh, Nepal, and other places. As a result, I think it's fair to say that these proxy forces are a fundamental element of Pakistani foreign policy. As Dr. Goel just pointed out, we have seen some of those groups extend their reach, and that is something we should be very concerned about. Lashkari Taiba and now the Pakistani Taliban, Tariq al Taliban Pakistan, have reached out not only to the United Kingdom, but to the United States as well. Um, there are some regular arguments that one hears about what motivates these militant groups. And if one goes to Pakistan or talks to Pakistani officials, there are really four explanations that they come up with, all of which are external to the state of Pakistan. Uh, the first would be the Afghan Mujahideen, the resistance to the Soviet Union which clearly involved an international effort to fund uh, irregular forces in Afghanistan to fight against Soviet occupation that cost billions of dollars, that shipped arms, it costs uh, tens if not hundreds of thousands of lives. A second explanation, more recent, is U.S. military operations in Afghanistan, that these have spurred the actions of militants in ways that um, endanger the Pakistani state. Uh, two other explanations. 
questions that will come up when one begins to dig further into the militant phenomenon is uh, Pakistani officials will argue that they are the scene of a proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia, that uh, Iran exported Shia militancy to Pakistan in the 1980s, and that the Saudis responded by exporting Salafist uh, militancy in the form of madrasas and other movements. Now, there is truth to all of these arguments. I mean, those are four perfectly reasonable external factors. They simply deny the complicity and agency of the Pakistani army and the Pakistani government. I would list four other internal factors that are fundamental to understanding Pakistani militancy. Um, the first is the army. The army uses these proxy groups and has since 1947. They're very convenient. They're very useful. They, have, they provide plausible deniability for carrying out violent actions against neighbors. The second is the ongoing problem of Kashmir, which remains fundamental in Indo-Pakistani relations. It is the dominant issue in Pakistani security calculations. It focuses all of their attention on India. And because there are Kashmiris on both sides of the line of control who frequently want to throw off Indian rule, there is a steady supply of potential militants that Pakistan can manipulate and use at various times. At times, Kashmir has been quiet. At other times, it has not. Um, a third factor is the national foundation, the role of religion in the Pakistani state. Pakistanis often compare themselves to Israel. They say that they are a Muslim state in a very troubled place and are surrounded by enemies. That's the kindest thing that they say about Israel in public discourse, unfortunately. Um, but it is a justification for some of the things that go on in the state. The role of religion in the state at independence was never resolved, and there have always been elements within the state that want uh, Sharia to play a more prominent role in the legal system, and they're willing to use violence to get there. Uh, last but not least, um, there are intra-faith problems inside Pakistan that are manipulated and resolved to some extent violently within Pakistan. This is not only the Sunni-Shia split that we're familiar with in, in the Middle East, but also Deobandi Salafists and Sufis. Uh, there are offshoot groups that Muslims in Pakistan condemn as non-Muslim, like the Ahmadiyyas, who are regular, regularly oppressed uh, through public violence. And many of the militant groups engage in these kinds of sectarian violence when they have nothing better to do. Some groups are specifically focused on this kind of sectarian violence, particularly see the Isahaba and Lashkari Zhangvi, which has now branched out to anti-Shia activity in Afghanistan, so it too is transnational. Um, the role of religion in the state and the national foundations is important because it helps explain why there's not going to be an Arab Spring in Pakistan. There are already legitimate Islamist political parties in Pakistan. Sharia is a regular part of Pakistan's irregular elections. Pakistan does have an infrastructure for democracy, although the military has ruled Pakistan for more than half of its existence. When democracy does exist, Islamist parties run. They have never won more than 12% of the vote at the national level. Uh, when they have been in power at the regional level, uh, most recently from 2002 to 2007, they have not governed terribly well, but there's political space for Islamist tendencies and Islamist preferences, including in some of the major parties. The Pakistan Muslim League of Nawaz Sharif is considered much more Islamist than the other main party in Pakistan. So these tendencies can be carried out. This is not an underground Muslim Brotherhood movement. These are open. Um, at the same time, what we have seen is increasing radicalization both of normal civil society and of militant groups. Um, more recently, there have been assassinations in 2011 of the Minister of Minority Affairs, a government cabinet level official who was a Christian, was assassinated in the streets of, Pun of Lahore by his bodyguard. The governor of Punjab was assassinated because he expressed opposition to blasphemy laws. And in both, in both cases, the public response was immediate and overwhelming in support of the killers. Now, in addition, we see illegal threats of, Islam, of Islamist militancy to the Pakistani government. The rise of the Pakistani Taliban 
and its threats to Pakistan look suspiciously like an al-Qaeda kind of attack on the near enemy. And the Pakistani Taliban's connections to al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda ideology are und indisputable. Um, those links of militant groups across the spectrum to al-Qaeda, however, are more interesting. You have both Deobandi groups, like jaish e Mohammed, which were allied with al-Qaeda as early as 1998. You also have al-Hadith and Salafist groups, like Lashkari Taiba, which are formally connected to al-Qaeda as well. So there's a lot of interplay. The Pakistani Taliban swears allegiance to the Afghan Taliban, which has its own set of connections to al-Qaeda. So these, uh, these relationships are murky, but in some cases they are now aimed at formally overthrowing the Pakistani state, which once created these groups and supported them as potential national assets. Um, thinking of, of the, last but not least, the fact that Osama bin Laden was in country, and as Dr. Golo pointed out, so many other leaders were in country, suggests that there may be ties between al-Qaeda and these militant group leaderships and the Pakistani Army and Intelligence Services. Um, four potential futures. Uh, and the, I'm going to use a very simple tool for looking at these. Uh, it's derived because we teach at the Naval War College and we teach Clausewitz 24-7. It's derived from Karl von Clausewitz's on war. The idea of the paradoxical or remarkable trinity, which is related to three separate groups uh, that are considered important for evaluating states, the government, the military, and the people. Um, thinking about the role of civilian inst civilian government institutions, the army, which certainly is the strongest and most important institution in Pakistan, and the role of the people, gives us some way of thinking about the futures of militancy in Pakistan. The first question is, will the status quo continue? Now, oddly enough, the status quo right now, despite all of our problems with Pakistan, is actually not bad. In fact, Professor Stephen Cohen, who's one of the leading experts on Pakistan, came to the, National, the Naval War College last year, and he explained to us that this is the strongest civilian government that Pakistan has ever had. For all of its apparent inefficiency and for all of our complaints, for all of its inability to gain control over a military that is largely autonomous in terms of foreign policy, this is still a government that is doing well in comparison to its predecessors. Um, it's worth thinking, however, about why that status quo may, quo may fail, and I would point to a couple of trends that are important. The first is that the two-party system, the Pakistan People's Party and the Pakistan Muslim League, appears right now to be under attack, and this is the closest that Pakistan gets to an Arab Spring. There is a new party, a relatively new party, called Pakistan Tariqi Insaf, PTI. Um, what makes it formidable is not organization or ideology or doctrine, what makes it formidable is the head of the party, who is Imran Khan, who is Pakistan's greatest cricket player. It's the equivalent of Michael Jordan forming a political party in the United States. Uh, except that, unfortunately, Imran Khan is not nearly as competent a manager or as capable a political figure as Michael Jordan. Uh, in fact, he was unable to get himself elected the first couple of times that he ran for office. Nevertheless, there is now a movement to bring PTI into power as a way of clearing the corruption of the traditional parties out of the way. Um, that's a faith-based alternative. And in point of fact, there is no evidence to suggest that if PTI comes into power, it will have any more autonomy or authority over the military than any other established party. Uh, this is, in fact, a cult of personality. But it suggests the level of dissatisfaction with existing political parties, and therefore a deteriorating status quo. Um, a second concern is the Urdu media. One of the few things that General slash President Musharraf did that was really forward-looking in the country was that he opened up the media. And as a result, Pakistan has a very, very vibrant and competitive media. It does not have what we would consider <laughs> standards of objective journalism, but it has a very vibrant and competitive media. And it is especially the Urdu media that needs to be watched because that accounts for 98% of the media in Pakistan. When you read the English newspapers, you are getting a purely elite view that has been filtered very carefully for a foreign audience in many respects. The Urdu media is increasingly militant in its tone. It is increasingly anti-Western. It is increasingly anti-American. Uh, it blames the American role in Afghanistan for all of Pakistan's ills, and it is increasingly pro-Taliban. This, again, is a disturbing trend that suggests the status quo is going downhill. Another issue that is emerging 
is the Army, this extremely important institution, uh, and in fact, the, the quip that many people use about Pakistan is that most states have an army. In the case of Pakistan, the army has a state. The army is that important and autonomous. Uh, it has rarely been challenged by civilian government, government. Well, the army is getting more observant. It is recruiting from more and more religious and conservative areas of Pakistan. So that the changing nature of the officer corps, which will eventually be reflected in the top levels of governance in the Pakistani army, and therefore in Pakistani foreign and national security policy, is changing in ways that are detectable. Um, last but not least, um, we see because of the failure of Pakistani civil society, and particularly the failure of state institutions to provide for basic needs, an increasing <coughs> role for non-governmental organizations in Pakistani society in things like education and basic welfare. Many of these non-governmental organizations, however, are run by militant groups, including Jawati Dawa, which is the uh, NGO backdrop for Lashkar-e Taiba, and was the first NGO on the ground after the earthquakes in Kashmir a few years ago. So there are lots of reasons to look and think that the status quo is eroding. So then the question is, well, what are our three other futures? Because I promised you four. Um, I'll start with a really good one, which is fixing the problem. Okay? Fixing the problem would really require the government, the people, and the military to all simultaneously and identify a common threat which would be the rise of militancy, which has been a significant threat. And in fact, in 2009, for a brief period of time, we did see a coalition of government, people, and military in response to a jihadist threat. When the Pakistani Taliban moved across the border from the tribal areas into the Northwest Frontier Province, seizing control of Bunar, of Deir, making peace negotiations with the Pakistani army, and eventually violating those and moving into the adjacent, adjacent province of Kunir, which put it 60 kilometers from Islamabad. At that point, for a number of reasons, a new civilian government that wanted to clear the radicals out of what was considered a settled area, a military that recognized that its reputation was on the line because it had attempted to displace the Taliban twice before and a population that was mobilized in an interesting way by a video. Uh, someone took a picture, a video with a cell phone of a woman being publicly whipped by Taliban authorities in Sudan. And this flamed across the Pakistani blogosphere and ignited the Pakistani populace. For the first time, they felt the Taliban was bad and that the government had to do something about it. So for a brief period of time, you had alignment between civilian government officials, the army, and the people. You had a mandate to go, and the Pakistani army went in, it went in hard, and it went in ugly. And it remains in SWAT today. There are very few indicators of, uh, of Taliban activity there. Um, so that is possible. However, it was unique, and that consensus immediately unraveled, and has continued to unravel ever since. So while one can say that as a possibility, it's probably a low a low-level possibility. Um, a second possibility, something the United States government worries about a great deal, is catastrophic collapse. Uh, and again, there are indicators, there's, there are foreshadowing of this happening in the past. To get catastrophic collapse, you would basically have to have failure in the government, uh, disinterest in the people, and the collapse or the co-optation of the military. This, an attempt was made to stage an Islamist coup in 1995. It was led by a major general. It has been described by the Pakistanis as comical because they caught it very quickly and suppressed it. But at the same time, it suggested that at that time, someone with uh, Islamist leanings that outweighed his loyalty to the army as an institution could get to the two-star rank. And from that point on, the Pakistani army has been more careful about how it vets its flag rank officers to make sure this doesn't happen again. Um, more recently, we have seen in response to a public response to drone strikes uh, being carried out in the tribal areas, the creation of something called the Defense of Pakistan Council. Now, the Defense of Pakistan Council holds major um, rallies in Islamabad and Lahore and places like this to protest American perfidy. Um, it is led by one of the leading Islamist politicians. Uh, and then three of the leaders, also in the Defense of Pakistan Council, are the heads, respectively, of Lashkar-e-Taiba, Jaishi Muhammad, both of which
which were privileged militant groups from Pakistani intelligence for fighting against Kashmir that now have broader interests. And last but not least, Sipasi Sahaba and Lashkar Jangvi, which are groups that focus primarily on the internal Shia problem. So here you have a public group that is allowed to carry out massive anti-American demonstrations. What's even more disturbing is the number of retired generals who show up on the podium, including guys like Hamid Ghul, former director of ISI, and Mirza Aslam Beg, former chief of army staff in Pakistan in the late 1980s. Um, one could see the possibility that this would happen, therefore, a catastrophic collapse where the military stepped back and allowed a revolution. Again, this seems very unlikely because it requires the army to, the, the highest levels of the army, to have loyalties to something other than the army. And there are not yet indications that that is happening in the, in the officer corps. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not becoming more religiously conservative. It just means that the army still takes care of the army first. Um, last but not least, and this I think is the most likely, is that on the idea of a generational erosion. Um, to think about this, you have to not only think about some of the trends I've raised a, a few moments ago, but also the continuing regionalization of major political parties, so that the Pakistan People's Party is more and more a Sindh party, while the Pakistan Muslim League is more and more a Punjab party. Um, there is a almost obsessive decentralization of government authority, uh, which is being carried out by the civilian government in an effort to provide better services. But this also means that the ability of the government to intervene is going to be less and less. And because authority will be carried out more at a local level, well, that happens to be where Islamist parties do their best work. More Islamists get elected at local and regional levels than at the national level because they have stronger voting bases and they're more interested in things going on there. So that could be a source of gradual radicalization. Uh, we see the army continuing to become more religious and observant. The definition of what we call moderate Pakistani politics is changing and will is drifting further and further to the right. Uh, women who once wore makeup and high heels in public now are told by their adult children not to leave the house unless they're covered. That's an anecdote, but it suggests something that's going on in the society. Uh, the end of Operation Enduring Freedom, the end of major fighting in Afghanistan, is going to free up large numbers of militants who then will have to find something to do. They may find something to do in Afghanistan, but many of them are going to come back to Pakistan and try and look for work there. Their definition of work may be very different than what we'd like to see. Uh, you see continuing sectarian and ethnic violence, and the creation of something the Pakistanis don't like to talk about, which is a Punjabi Taliban. In the past, the Taliban has been Pashtun, but now you see Punjabis, including members of groups like Jaishi Muhammad, who are becoming more and more Taliban in outlook more radical, more opposed to the state and the intelligence services that created them. The result is that in 2030, Pakistan's going to look very different. It's going to have a population of 300 million people. It is not going to be able to employ all those people. It'll have somewhere between 200 and 500 nuclear weapons, and it will have a deteriorating relationship with the United States that will only be exacerbated by the growing relationship between the United States and India. As a result, I would argue that by 2030, Pakistan will be ripe for a much more militant outlook in its domestic and foreign policy. Whether that comes by a coup or by gra gradual evolution, it's going to be a much bigger problem, and it will be a problem with greater reach. With that happy thought, I will end. much. Uh, actually, Tim has left very little for me to say. Uh, but uh, when I reached the Ben Gurion airport, uh, I found uh, my taxi driver waiting uh, with a piece of paper which had this written on it, which is my name. The only difference is that between Ashok and Mehta, there was another full stop. So when I walked out of immigration and I said, let's go, he said, where are the others? <laughs> the 
full stops. Uh, in India, what happened once that they had put the word uh, after Major General R E T D, which is retired, and I was introduced as Major General Retarded. <laughs> <laughs> So after I do my 15 minutes, you'll probably think that was justified. <laughs> um, I think you heard everything about Pakistan that had to be said has been said. And it has not been said by an Indian. It has been said by an American and a third generation Indian now in the United Kingdom. Uh, so I really don't even have to try. So what I will in fact try and do is to shift the focus from Pakistan. Because if you look at the subject, the subject is much wider. It, it talks about rise of Islam in South Asia. And it also mentions three countries. So at the moment, we only talked about one country. So let me uh, bring in the other two. But you cannot help uh, try and wrap up, or what I might call strategically wrap up what has been said so far about Pakistan, because that, as a number of American foreign um, uh, secretaries of state have said, they have called Pakistan the fount, the incubator, the epicenter of terrorism. In fact, Madame Madeleine Albright called it an international migraine. Now, we, 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 we don't have to look around why that is the case. But I think there are other reasons why we need to worry strategic reasons why we need to worry about Pakistan. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why the worry about Pakistan has shifted, and we have, as they say in cricket, we have taken the eye off the ball, is because of our preoccupation with Iran and our preoccupation with the US presidential election. As a result, the game, the seriousness with which the game was being played in Pakistan is no longer the case. Now, why we should worry about Pakistan is that Pakistan has created these terrorist groups which uh, Mike Mullen, the chairman, joint chiefs of staff, called the veritable arm of the ISI, ISI being the military intelligence of the army, and what Pakistan is called their crown jewels. Now these strategic groups operate, terrorist groups, are meant to provide what Pakistan calls strategic depth. Strategic depth in Afghanistan and strategic depth in India. In India, in Kashmir, and in Afghanistan, well, as far as uh, the Taliban can go. So that's the first point. Now, the other reason why we need to worry about Pakistan is that it has nuclear arsenal. It has the third or the fourth largest nuclear arsenal in the world. And it is growing at the fastest rate than any of the other nuclear arsenals. And if we are to look at what happened last month in Pakistan, when an attack was mounted against the Kamra aeronautical base, and that was not the first time an attack was mounted against Kamra. It was the fourth time an attack was mounted. And Kamra is known to have, although some people say no, nuclear weapons. Only last week there was a scare about uh, an attack on 
Yeragazi Khan, which is the largest nuclear arsenal in Pakistan. The Pakistan Army, the Pakistani Navy, the Pakistani Air Force, the Pakistani military intelligence, all these institutions which are regarded as the most stable institutions, the military, have been attacked by terrorist groups. And pointedly, the attacks are against institutions where these nuclear weapons are kept. And these attacks are happening because of insider collusion, because of the radicalization of not just Pakistan or the Talibanization of Pakistan, but the serious radicalization of the Pakistan military. So we should be worried about not just the radicalization of civil society, not just the radicalization of the religious groups and, and other institutions, but of the military, which is regarded as a, a, a stable institution. We should also be worried because of Pakistan's, so you know those who say that uh, a nuclear weapon, once Iran goes uh, nuclear, it's more likely that Hezbollah might get it. I would rather argue that chances of that nuclear device or a dirty bomb getting into one of these 135 terrorist groups is more likely to happen in Pakistan. So we should be worried. We should also be worried because Pakistan has the worst record of nuclear proliferation. I mean, whether it's uh, North Korea, whether it's Libya, whether it's Saudi Arabia, including Iran, there is no country which has aspired for nuclear weapons that has not had help from AQ Khan and the nuclear Walmart. So we need to worry. And we also need to worry that Pakistan today has lost relations with its best friend, the United States. And I recall in London only last month, the former ambassador to the United K Kingdom, and I won't mention her name, she said that she described US-Pakistan relations with two songs. The first was, Who's sorry now? <laughs> and the second was, money can't buy you love. <laughs> and that, in fact, encompasses the state of relations between US and Pakistan. US-Pakistan uh, relations with Iran, Pakistan relations with Afghanistan, Pakistan relations with India, Pakistan relations with China, Nobody trusts Pakistan, not even China. So I think I have, I, I have dug the knife deeper into Pakistan, which I had not intended. Uh, so this is the unintended consequences of two of my earlier speakers. So why we should, why we should be worried about what, what is happening in Pakistan? But why should, let me bring in India now. Why should India be worried? Well, India should be worried because it is in what I call the spillover zone. If you look at the history of the suicide bomber, if you look at the history of terrorism, that movement has taken place from the Middle East to Iraq to Afghanistan to Pakistan, and it is on the border with India. India has every reason to worry that in 2014, when the Americans and the Allies, the NATO, would leave Afghanistan, what kind of an Afghanistan would they leave behind? And who would be the recipient of the spillover? Those horrendous scenarios that were painted by the speaker before me are quite feasible. And therefore, the spillover comes. And this happens, I don't need to mention, after Mumbai, 
And this happens after India has fought several wars and has been the target of, uh, of, of, of Pakistani ire and Pakistani uh, machinations. So let me come to the third part, and which is that, and, and this is what I, I had intended to speak about, that if in, because Kashmir was one of the reasons that was mentioned by Tim. Well, I've heard uh, the, uh, the former president of Pakistan, General Parvez Musharraf, address a Rotarians meeting and he said, and I quote, this is 2008, or 2000, yeah, 2008, uh, I beg your pardon, 2007, that uh, when he said that even if the Kashmir issue was to be resolved, cross-border terrorism would continue. India-Pakistan relations would not improve because there is a congenital problem. So what I would then say is that we, India and Pakistan, if their relations improve, then it would contribute to peace, stability, and well-being of Afghanistan, which will actually bring me on to the third country which is involved is Afghanistan. And we are all concerned about Afghanistan. Uh, at least most of us are concerned uh, the, the countries who provide troops, troop contributing countries, and the troops who have in, invested so much for what the gains that have been achieved. Now what is the problem? The problem is that the Americans started off by calling it AFPAC, Afghanistan, Pakistan. And we went along with Afghanistan, Pakistan club together. Initially, the idea was to make it AFPAC, India, because the, all three, uh, because India uh, get, gets into the uh, zone of fire. But they took away India and they left it to Afghan. But they made a serious blunder. They made, the Americans made two serious blunders. One, that they announced the date of their exit uh, even before they had finished their mission. And number two, instead of calling it PAC-AF, they called it af -PAC. <laughs> Because the real problem was Pakistan, as they have now discovered. You know, you can de declare Haqqani group as a foreign terrorist organization. So the failure, the failure to punish Pakistan in time, the, 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 the uh, reasons of appeasement of Pakistan have led to this uh, distorted uh, frame, uh, uh, phraseology of AFPAC, which should really have been pac -AF. So what am I then talking about? I'm talking about two basic issues. I'm talking about how India and Pakistan should get together as part, in fact, as I speak, we've just finished uh, what a lot of people call uh, uh, a dialogue that has taken place. Uh, atmospheric confidence building measures have, have, have been achieved, but no substantial issues have come to gain because the contest, the contest between India and Pakistan has shifted to Afghanistan. Because in Afghanistan, India has invested $2 billion in socioeconomic development, in capacity building, in institution building. Every, pop, every Gallup poll that has been held in 2011, whether it was ARD, BBC, ABC, CNN have rated India as the most popular contributor, most popular country in Afghanistan. And so that's uh, anathema for Pakistan. And so Pakistan uses its Haqqani network to target Indians inside Afghanistan. And so uh, I, run a, I run a track too which deals with India-Pakistan. I run a trilateral 
which deals with India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And since 2007, we have been suggesting that India and Pakistan should discuss Afghanistan. But Pakistanis refuse to do so. They say if we talk about Afghanistan with India, it would legitimize India's role in Afghanistan. Because Pakistanis believe that India has no role in Afghanistan, forgetting that before the partition of Afghanistan, before the, the, the border, uh, the boundaries changed, India had a common frontier with Afghanistan. And so this is one riddle that we are trying to resolve. And the second problem is, uh, as far as Afghanistan is concerned, is that Pakistanis believe, and this is again, uh, this, this also feeds into what Tim said, is that Pakistanis believe that in Afghanistan, what the Indians are doing is up to no good, that they are fueling an insurgency in Baluchistan, that they are helping these Taliban groups, the Tehreek Taliban Pakistan, which have now found strategic depth in Afghanistan, that India is actually helping them, which is, there is nothing of the sort. And therefore, we uh, need to talk to uh, Pakistan to remove their misgivings about what India is really up to. And finally, let me say what is the way forward? Because the way forward for this region, this South Asia region, which is a victim of both history, geography, and demography. Uh, you heard that 300 million people, the population of South Asia, which is under, under, under nourished, underdeveloped, uh, in 2030 will increase by one third. And there are more Muslims, if you talk about rise of Islam, it's actually ri not rise of Islam, it is rise of extremism. It is rise of uh, a perverted version of Islam. And so I, I really don't think, because you have, you have a country like Maldives in South Asia. Maldives is now built, it, it, it built as another staging post for Al-Qaeda. You have Bangladesh. So between Bangladesh, India, India has the second largest Muslim population after Indonesia even more than Pakistan and Bangladesh. So this region has the highest concentration of Muslims anywhere in the world. That's South Asia. So what needs to be done is are two things. Yesterday, uh, it was mentioned that you need an international coalition. But I would suggest that the first thing that we have to do is to urge the Americans and the allies, NATO allies, that not to cut and run from Afghanistan. There have been very valuable gains that have been made in Afghanistan through precious lives of Canadian soldiers, Australian soldiers, American soldiers, British soldiers, and other 25 countries uh, who are on NATO. Now, those gains that have been made must not be frittered away because of a presidential election or because of any other political compulsions. That, that's the first thing. That it must be, as President Barack Obama has said, a responsible withdrawal. And the second, and I will end after making the second uh, recommendation. The second recommendation is where you need an international coalition. A coalition of the willing that must be ready, prepared to invest in fixing Pakistan. Because if you go away from Afghanistan without fixing Pakistan, then we will, India and the rest of South Asia, will receive all the help. So these two things have to happen, and they have to happen together. It's not sequential, because these two, that's the way forward. And, and therefore, I would urge, I would urge the, uh, the, the countries that uh, are involved that uh, they take this, uh, their responsibility.
responsibility uh, to the region because the, you, you heard Mr. Sanjay talk about the attacks in, 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 in Great Britain. Uh, you heard the likelihood now of, 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 of targeting Germany. Well, if that, uh, if that happens, then uh, all the gains that you would have made for so long would have been lost. That would be a very sad thing. Thank you.
very much uh, aware of what's going on there. I'm somewhat frustrated about what's going on there. Uh, but there are many things that the ISAF may do to inadvertently help the Taliban. And one is to fail to gain partial governance reform. By that, uh, one does not mean turning Afghanistan into a full-fledged democracy, but at a minimum, introducing reforms that will make it more difficult for local governors and chiefs to make land grabs, putting uh, evicted villagers and small landholders in a destitute state and susceptible to the entreaties of the Taliban who stand to make gains from the inside that they are unable to achieve on the battlefield. The Taliban really are losing on the battlefield. The Taliban may be strict and they may be repressive, especially against women, but compared to the local governors, they are still seen as honest. Second, Pakistan's life gets more difficult, in my opinion, as ISAF draws down. Why? Because the ISAF has provided a focus, a target for the Taliban insurgents and the Haqqani network, this very Haqqani network that we just, in the last couple of days, uh, declared a terrorist group by the United States. As the Western footprint gets smaller and smaller in the coming year, the Taliban might go on two quite separate vectors. In one, they go home, the war is over, they're tired of fighting, sort of, sort of like Iraq after 2007. But the other vector is Taliban triumphalism. They, they won. The, uh, the Americans have gone home, and now they might say, well, we've, dri we've driven them out of Afghanistan onward to Islamabad. And in preparing for this next target, which is the Pakistan government and army, the groups like the TTP, Tehrik uh, Taliban Pakistan, Get replenished, they get replenished from their Taliban cousins across the border in Afghanistan, the bits of eastern Afghanistan that become sanctuaries for the Pakistan Taliban in their fight against the state of Pakistan. So this is kind of a reversal of the current situation where now we have the Afghan Taliban having sanctuaries in Pakistan. You see what happens? The Afghan becomes the sanctuary and the war goes in. My prediction is that the Taliban are likely to retain inroads in the Pashtun area of Afghanistan. Is that good news for Pakistan, that, that the Taliban are in those areas bordering Pakistan in, in Afghanistan? Well, it, it, I'm not so sure. If the, if the Taliban become too dominant on the Afghan side, they can you know, leak across the border. So while much of Afghanistan may not be overridden by the Taliban as in the 1990s following the last U.S. withdrawal in 1989, the areas near Pakistan's borders are unlikely to remain under the firm control of Kabul. That's a given. Shifting our focus to Pakistan and terrorism, who will better represent the aspirations of the Pashtun in the frontier area in northwest Pakistan? The Punjab-dominated army, or the TTP, the, the large the sort of confederation of Taliban groups in Pakistan. I believe that the Pakistanis will miss the United States. A light U.S. footprint in the region puts Pakistan at a relative disadvantage <laughs> against the stronger India, whose economy will be 16 times larger in 2030, according to an upcoming report from the United States National Intelligence Council. 16 times. Even though the 180 million Pakistan population is projected to grow to 300 million by 2050, India will be the most populated country in the world, passing China with 1.65 billion people or more than five times the population of Pakistan projected in 2030. Now let's look at the other Pakistan militant groups. Who are they and where are they heading over the next few years? Who are their supporters likely to be and what are their targets likely to be? What are the likely government of Pakistan strategies for dealing with Pakistan militant groups? How important is the future stability or instability of Afghanistan to the future of Pakistan and terrorism? If the Pakistan militant groups are the fish, what is the Pakistan sea in which these militant fish when? Well, let me start where I, I plan to end up, which is with, uh, could you let me know when we get to I'll believe me, I will. Okay. <laughs> let, let me start where I will end up with 
five general scenarios on where Pakistan militant groups are heading, and maybe I won't have a chance to repeat this, so get it down now. Uh, one is uh, Pakistan militant groups are likely to increasingly cooperate among each other. Uh, there is a trend toward greater cooperation that is likely to continue. They will find it more and more useful to mount joint operations, share intelligence, tactical knowledge, and sources of funding. There is also likely to be increasing fluidity among the memberships. Fragmentation. There is likely to be more fragmentation within militant groups as they pursue separate agendas. Diminished state control. I, you know, I could be talking about the Middle East, North Africa right now. Fragmentation, diminished state control. I mean, look what's happening in Libya right now. Without breaking ties to the ISI, the, pa the Pakistan Intelligence uh, Unit, Lashkar al Taiba will continue to grow closer to the anti-state groups with which it shares ideological affinity and common external enemies. Factions of Lashkar Taiba, displeased with Islamabad's regional policies, may break away from the ISI allied Lashkar Taiba to engage in militant operations detrimental to the interests of the Pakistan state. In other words, Pakistan loses control over the Lashkar Taiba. Global Jihad is probably the most interesting to this group. We are likely to see those militant groups that are normally focused on attacking the Pakistan state broaden their ambitions to include rhetorically as well as operationally threats to the United States and its international partners. The outcome of the NATO counterinsurgency strategy in Afghanistan will have a profound effect on their ability, capability to plan and mount attacks elsewhere. In other words, the less effective Kabul's control over Southeast Afghanistan in the coming years, the greater the danger that Pakistan militant groups or Afghan affiliates of Pakistan militant groups can plan attacks in the region and beyond. And finally, we see, we, I see an increasingly Islamist society. There's little reason to believe that Pakistan's political or military leadership will push back against the Isl Islamist perspective and defend working with the United States in counterterrorism policy. It's just not that kind of support. Um, I'm going to skip the, the dis brief description of the pa Pakistan military groups. I have a feeling that this group, we, we've been inundated with a lot of details. But let me just mention the targets of the Pakistan military groups. And the first and foremost, should not surprise anybody, is India. The second is kind of interesting. It's the Shia inside Pakistan. Uh, the third is the government of Pakistan. And the fourth is the global jihad. In many ways, let me amplify on this. The, the global jihad, which targets Westerners and Jews, has the most upside. Until now, actual attacks in the United States or its Western partners have been relatively few. The attack on the Chabad, the Chabad house during the Mumbai assault back in 2008 was an add-on to an essentially, I mean, it was really the last minute that they picked that target, uh, but it was essentially a Lashkar al-Taiba operation against India. India was the main target. But this, I fear, this uh, additional target uh, uh, assaulting uh, Americans and Jews, uh, and I believe uh, they had Israeli citizens. It broke a taboo. It's a, it, you know, these, these taboos mean that it, it could lead the possibility of future Mumbai-type attacks in Europe, in, in European cities and elsewhere. The Times Square attempt that you may remember is was sponsored by the uh, TTP, um, uh, and that provides a glimpse into the global reach of Pakistan military groups. The global jihad depends not only on Al-Qaeda, as Al-Qaeda possibly diminishes following Abbottabad, one might see other groups that have global capacity, like Lashkar al-Taiba, fill the breach and begin organizing attacks abroad. I guess the last target is, of course, the regional and local focus. And there, I, I think I'm talking about the Haqqani group, which really is doing so much damage to uh, the Americans in Afghanistan, to, to Afghan government. But they, 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 the Haqqani network is mainly about Afghanistan, it's not global. Now let me just uh, wrap it up here. I, I hope I can save a few minutes uh, because we do want to do some uh, Q&A. Um, 
as the jihadist narrative of the militant groups becomes more mainstream in Pakistan society, the ability of the secular elites of Pakistan to resist further advances of Pakistan militant groups' control is reduced. Now, this is not to say that the Pakistan militant groups are about to take over Pakistan. It's not, it's not that simple. As long as, one, the military <coughs> remains cohesive and united, and two, the public remains fundamentally conservative. It's a fundamentally conservative society, resistant to any ideology, whether it be Islamist or Western. And three, as long as deep ethnic differences between Punjab and Sin, the Pashtun, Baluch, to name a few, continue to mute the national appeal of Pakistan militant groups, then I think the government of Pakistan is unlikely to fall to the extremists. Pakistan militant groups will continue to exist and possibly even thrive in a weak state, in a, larger, in, in a weak state and a larger Pakistani sea that is likely to be increasingly receptive to anti-US, xenophobic, conspiratorial, Islamist agenda of the Pakistan militant groups. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be wrapping up the presentation this afternoon. I'm the last speaker. I'll be talking of uh, terrorism challenges from a multi-ethnic, in a multi-ethnic society, from the Philippine perspective. I may have to cram a lot of information in 15 minutes. Uh, don't worry, there's a wall clock behind you. I'm glad it's not a calendar. So like what I mentioned yesterday, the Philippines is a nation of 100 million people, archipelago 7,107 islands, low tide, we lose some on high tide. It's a very <laughs> mixed, it's a mixed society, different people, different languages. Uh, background history is Malay, Spanish, American, Japanese cultures. 150 different dialects. We have Christian, Islam, Hindus, Buddhist. We are a developing country. We have some challenges in the import-export of our products. One thing we don't have a problem in exporting is terrorism. Uh, Omar Patek, Dul Matin, some of the terrorists who have found their way to Pakistan came from the Philippines. A lot of them also went to uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, they crossed over there. The Philippines has seven major ethnic groups, six major religions, and Almost every ethnic group has the same religion, dialect. In the same region, they live in the same region. These things, customs and traditions. Muslims basically inhabit the southern part of the Philippines, the island of Mindanao. 1960s, there was an effort to counter insurgency by putting more Christians in southern Mindanao. Whether this had an effect or not, we would see later on. In a study done by a colleague of mine, he found out that in an area where there are a lot of different ethnic groups, where poverty exists, where the people need more education, these are areas which, which are prone to conflict. Southern Mindanao is controlled by Christians, but a lot of these are Muslims. 15% are Muslims. Of the different threat groups that the Philippines faces, Currently, the Moro Islamic Liberation Front in Mindanao is the strongest. The MILF itself, while it is a secessionist group fighting for an independent, autonomous region in the Philippines, they are composed of different ethnic groups. When facing a common enemy, they are strong. But among themselves, we also see skirmishes or engagements be between them. The Abu Siyaf group, the third group that we are facing, the first are the Communists, the second, the MILF, the third, the Abu Sayyaf group. This group has links with the foreign terrorist organizations, the FTOs, or the local terror organizations. The problem with this is that the MILF at the tactical level and the Abu Sayyaf, they merge following ethnic lines. At the national level, we don't see this. At the local level, we see this. 
2005, I was assigned in Southern Mindanao. One of the major operations that Omar Patek, Dul Martin, and the other JI leadership were there, Central Mindanao. I was a skipper of a ship. We encountered this boat. 30 or 40 armed men on board. They had the legitimate cover. All documents were there. It was only after six months that we knew, based on inter reports, that this was one ethnic group of the MILF, cuddling the JI ASG. Why? Because they had common ethnic lines. They went from central Mindanao all the way to Basilan, Polo, and Tawi Tawi, where the ASG has found the sanctuary. The MILF used to be under uh, Nur Miswari, a professor from the Fili Fili University of the Philippines. The ASG leadership, Abdurrahman Janjalani, was trained in Afghanistan. He was schooled in Saudi Arabia and Libya. The current leadership of the ASG, while they are using the issues of illiteracy, poverty, they are not the average people that we will find below. They have been schooled in among the best schools of the Philippines. They have received foreign training abroad. In short, the issues are merely used as uh, multipliers for them to be able to recruit for their ranks. Peace building, growth with equity, literacy, capital outlay, these are the challenges below, which we hope that we have been telling the government that these are the issues that you have to face. Like what I mentioned yesterday, the current campaign plan has been telling the government these are not military concerns. You need to take a bigger look at this, infuse more of the not, uh, OGAs, other government agencies, their efforts should be directed towards these challenges, not the military. For a long time, the military has been the default mode of the insurgency, secessionist and terrorist threats that we face. The armed forces efforts for peace building, we are the supported effort. We have been telling the government, growth with equity, literacy, capital outlay, these are issues that we have only to support the other government agencies. We will be behind you, you do your share. The approaches are cultural awareness, cross-cultural insensitivity, interfaith dialogue, replicating national programs locally. While the armed forces budget, the Department of Defense budget should not be used uh, directly to address these issues, they are there to complement the military effort. However, OGAs and LGUs, local government units, need to come in and throw in their resources. Capacitating local governance Local government units, this has been a challenge that we have took upon ourselves for the past 30 or 40 years. That's why you would see military men acting part-time as teachers in the areas where there are no teachers from the government. Acting as doctors where the Department of Health could not go. Little by little, our current plan has been telling them, you need to take on the effort when it comes to these issues. We will be supporting you, but you need to take it upon yourselves. A lot of the projects right now are concentrated on winning the peace. When we say winning the peace, the bigger picture is to win the peace, not to defeat the enemy. Again, I mentioned yesterday, uh, killing is never an easy job, more so if these are your countrymen. For the past years, we have been used as the wrong tool for insurgency. Although we have had an, a successful story in the 1950s or 60s under then President Ramon Magsaysay, the Huk Balahap movement. After that, we seem to have lost track. And the natural mode of the government was to say, armed forces, take care, take charge. Right now, we are trying to have a paradigm shift, telling them that we need to win the peace. We don't need, winning the war is easier, but winning the peace is a more difficult challenge. In short, the Philippines right now is in a paradigm shift. We are trying to focus on what really is our task, being the armed forces. All other issues we will be doing a supporting role to them. A lot of this would include PC development efforts, would include capacitating the local leadership, would include bringing in investors through development and security. 12 minutes. You're my hero. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> you stand for, for you too. Mark Janis, 
past and I'm from the Naval War College as well. And like my colleague uh, Tim Hoyt, I have to have a disclaimer. My views do not represent the Department of Defense, the Navy, or for that matter, any other problem-based life forms uh, known to man. What I'm going to talk about today is uh, some of my experience in Afghanistan as a civilian advisor uh, in both uh, Jalalabad and the southern part, uh, I mean, in the northern part of, uh, uh, of Afghanistan and in uh, Kandahar in the southern section. And one of the things that, um, that we teach at the War College, and that is uh, an axi axiom of, of warfare, is that um, war is the use of violence to achieve political ends. Uh, but that's only part of the game. In fact, the only way to really understand warfare is to understand it as a political campaign. Uh, warfare isn't just the use of conventional violence to achieve a political end. Warfare is a component of many other aspects. If you're going to war, you're not just using the one tool in your arsenal, the military tool. You're actually using a wide variety of tools, diplomatic, informational, and political. Uh, and I think we lose sight of that. And particularly when you're encountering either an insurgency or a terrorist organization, uh, because very rarely can you actually defeat those groups militarily. You have to actually defeat them politically if you hope to really, truly have a better state of peace. And I think one of the things about Afghanistan that made it very difficult for the United States is that it was a particularly treacherous political landscape. The US was in the worst position possible. It was seen as the incumbent power even though it wasn't the official power in Afghanistan, which placed the Afghan government in a politician's dream. When anything went well, the Karzai government certainly could and should have taken credit. And when things went bad, President Karzai just looked at the United States and ISAF forces and said, it's their fault. So in many ways, what happened here, it was very difficult to, to gain political legitimacy because the Karzai government was seen as a puppet of the United States by many Afghans. As a result, the only way it could gain legitimacy was to attack the United States politically as often as possible. And frankly, I, I grew up, I started working my first political campaign at the age of nine, and uh, that's just the way I learned how to think. Uh, and if I were Karzai's political advisor, I would have told Karzai to, to criticize the United States and ISAF even more so than he does. Uh, because the only way to demonstrate that you're not an American puppet uh, is to be as independent from that force as possible. So what is domestically, politically astute for Karzai ended up making it very difficult uh, for international forces to operate effectively within that area. Now, if you look at the Karzai government and the International Security Assistance Forces led by the United States and Afghanistan as the incumbent powers, then the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, they were the challengers. And as in any political campaign, challengers do not have to be particularly substantive. Change you can believe in, for example. All they have to do is ask people, are you better off now than you were before this government came into power? This is a traditional thing that all challengers, even in democratic uh, systems, uh, use to try to convince people that it's time to change government. As a result, what happens here is they have to build, the Taliban and Al-Qaeda have to build on the dissatisfaction among the population, which is particularly easy for insurgent or terrorist organizations because they can make life even more miserable than, from, than the Afghans had previously had. So as a result of that, you have this wonderful tautological aspect to it in which the Taliban kept asking, are you better off than you were before? But they're the ones primarily making it worse than it was before itself. And yet they don't have to have the blame for this because the Karzai government is being blamed for the bad situation even though the Taliban is causing the bad situation. It's a wonderful position for an insurgent to be in. The next aspect is that the playing field is not level. Playing fields are never level but particularly so in Afghanistan. The US and its allies, the Afghan government, are expected to uphold international norms and rules of engagement. And they are heavily and rightfully criticized when they do not. On the other hand, the enemy has been labeled a terrorist. As a result, they are expected 
to break rules of engagement. They're expected not to perform in any kind of humanitarian basis whatsoever. As a result, you know the old adage, what is news? News is when man bites dog, not when dog bites man. So when terrorists act as terrorists, no one's surprised. As a result, it makes winning hearts and minds much more difficult for the Afghan government of the United States and its allies. Let's look at the Taliban's political ground game. Again, this is a political campaign. Here you have a simple narrative that's repeated endlessly. And that narrative is very, very effective. The coalition is here to occupy Afghanistan and destroy Islam. These are outsiders. These are illegitimate forces that have come to conquer Afghanistan. If anyone knows anything about Afghan history, it is a history replete with outside forces attempting to conquer the territory. So this is a narrative that works very well in, in Afghan culture. Added to that, this fight for political and legitimacy goes through a lot of other contexts as well. When you're looking at creating a narrative, the first thing you have to look at is who the messenger is. Is the messenger a legitimate messenger? Well, as much as we might despise Mullah Omar, he's a very legitimate messenger. He is someone who's been fighting with every occupying force in the last 30 years. He's a hero of the Soviet invasion, um, and he has continued the fight for Afghan independence uh, throughout the last several decades. So if you compare Mullah Omar to Karzai, you can certainly understand where both individuals have a degree of legitimacy um, and the Afghan government is going to have a difficult time attacking this individual. Second, what do you do? You build on local grievances. And the yeah, Taliban have a tremendous uh, number of lo legitimate local grievances that they can exploit. Corruption, poverty, the drug trade, and go on and on about this dysfunctional government and country. Poor uh, um, economic opportunities, high unemployment. So one of the things that they do is they employ young men. There's a wonderful uh, book called The Accidental Gorilla. And this book makes the statement that a lot of people become involved in insurgencies or terrorist organizations because they have nothing better to do, that they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And if you have a whole bunch of angry, young, unemployed men between the ages of 16 and 30, you're going to have a potent population to exploit. And the Taliban does a wonderful job doing that. Plus, you have a culture in Afghanistan that's built on um, a militaristic you know, culture. Uh, as a result, young men know how to fire weapons at a very young age. Um, and it is something that is, um, you know, to be in the military, to be a fighter is a very prestigious thing uh, for a young male. Then they, these are the carrot approaches. They took it, you know, you look at uh, legitimate grievances, you try to explode that, you give people jobs, you do that. Um, the other aspect to it, though, is that you punish those who do not follow you. This is a long, long history of that, right? You go into villages, you try to recruit, and if there are problems in those villages, if the village elders don't support you, well, then you literally kill them. So it's a combination of intimidation and then ideological and theological um, attraction uh, to the cause. And then they do something else, and that is establish Sharia law. Now, one of the things that's important to remember about Sharia law is that as tough as it is, as brutal as Sharia law is, it is preferable to anarchy. And it's preferable to the kind of corrupt governmental structures that Afghans have become used to um, as a result of the corrupt nature of the Afghan government. As a result, what's happening here is that a lot of the Afghans are attracted to Sharia law because it gives them something that they can rely on and something that they believe is a neutral arbitrator between disputes among the people. Here's the United States and the Afghan government narrative. If you want to compare the two. Top-down governance. One of the fascinating things that the Taliban did is that the initial defeat, the military defeat in the first three or four months of the Afghan war in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, the Taliban were virtually militarily defeated. And what did they do? They dispersed and moved in 
to Pakistan for safe haven. But then they began a traditional Leninist strategy. And that is, and, and Mao, of course, was even better than Lenin at this, and that is you, dis you disperse into the countryside and you begin political agitation and political organization in their hinterlands where the government isn't present. And by organizing at the grassroots level, you build a strong foundation for a lasting insurgency. And that is precisely what the Taliban did. It's very difficult to root out an insurgency that begins at the grassroots political level. And if you look at what the Americans and ISAF and the Afghan government did, is they did the exact opposite. Instead of fighting at the grassroots level, like any campaign should, it started from the top down. It established national uh, uh, elections. It created a national judiciary. All these things from the top down had no root in Afghan culture and society. As a result, the Afghans didn't relate to it as well. And it was also, again, um, more prone to being corrupt. So you have two campaigns, one working from the bottom up and one working from the top down, and we wonder why one took better route than the other. And then there is something else, and that's the difficulty of an outside group trying to bring political and economic change to a foreign country. Again, you have the problem of legitimacy. And here what happens are the unintended symbols of occupation. Remember what I said about the Taliban narrative. This is an outside force that's attacking you, trying to, you know, an imperial force trying to conquer Afghanistan, and also try to defeat Muslims. Well, look at the pictures here. This is uh, an MRAP, an up, uh, armored vehicle that the United States military and, and actually all of ISAF forces use. In order, this is Jalalabad, in order for someone to come out of any base camp, even if you're going to go a kilometer outside, two kilometers outside, you usually had five of these in the convoy going down narrow streets. This happens to be in downtown Jalalabad. Now, when we went down narrow streets, what happens is all other traffic had to pull off onto the sidewalk. And if you notice up here, it's an American soldier with a 50 cal machine gun. Now imagine someone driving down downtown Tel Aviv uh, with a machine gun pointed at everyone as they drive by. This is not going to engender warm hearted feelings of love and affection. It's going to engender fear. Now if the message that ISAF is trying to convey that we're here to help you we're here to help you establish yourself and establish democracy in that country. What does that very picture tell you? It's the opposite message. We're here to conquer you. And then if you look, this is a, uh, one of the American, the, one of the larger American bases um, in Afghanistan. And it's encircled with barbed wire, um, with uh, all kinds. It looks like a huge prison. And you, we had these dotted throughout Afghanistan. Again, the unintended message here is that not only are we building fortresses within your country, but we don't trust you. If you're going to fight in a counterinsurgency, you need to be out with the people, not behind the wire. Now, believe me, I felt very good being there at night, and I felt very good being in here. I did not want to die. I'm not a particularly brave human being, which is why I have a PhD. Um, <laughs> but the unintended message is we had to get out and walk the streets. Okay, conclusions. Strategic lessons. The first strategic lesson is something that many of you um, who are geeks like me and studying international politics uh, have heard of, imperial overstretch. Now, traditional powers uh, declined because they conquered too much territory, and as a result, the ability for them to maintain large, uh, con you know, large areas of conquest uh, eventually took a toll on their resources, right? You take over too many territories, it becomes very difficult for you to maintain those territories, it's very costly, and as a result, your power gradually diminishes. That's traditional decline. The U.S. doesn't look in terms of territorial conquest. So how do we fit into that? Well, there are two potential factors behind 
uh, the possibility, and I only say the possibility of U.S. decline. First, it's attributed to the economic and military commitments to democratization in politically inhospitable places. Democracy is something that you just can't plant in any soil in the world. It has to be a soil ready that's fertile enough and accepting enough of democratic principles that it will take root. So when we look at examples of where democracy has really succeeded, you have to look at the culture in which it succeeded. And I think the hubris that we can implant democracy anywhere at any time uh, is just that. It's pride. And of course, pride always leads to the fall, right? The second aspect is that democratization does not grow from the barrel of the gun, uh, to, to misquote Bob, right? You can't force democracy down the throats of another people. They have to come to it themselves. And I think here you see the, the example of the United States after World War II, um, and it's always used, you know, well, okay, you know, we, after World War II, uh, we started the Marshall Plan in Europe, and, and, and Germany became a democratic state, and then Japan became a democratic state, so if it succeeded there, why couldn't it succeed elsewhere? Well, because there were roots of democracy in both uh, Germany and in Japan. Japan less so, but certainly in Germany. Um, and it was a different time. At the end of World War II, the enemy accepted defeat. At the end of, and during the Afghan war and the war in Iraq, it's not so, you're not so sure whether or not the enemy is going to ever accept defeat. And democracy can only, only work if you've got a population that's willing to accept the fact that their guy, their candidate, is going to lose. And in many countries, that's just not impossible. It's just impossible for them to accept that. Why? Because the differences are so great. We look, you know, for example, the United States, you know, the, the campaign's going on right now, and you talk to most Americans, they go, oh my God, the Republicans and Democrats, they have such radically different platforms that I don't, I don't know how, you know, the country's going to succeed if the Democrats win again or if the Republicans win. Um, the fact is, the United States is the vanilla ice cream of the political um, uh, campaigns. There's not that radical of difference between Republicans and Democrats. But there's a radical difference in Afghan politics, between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan or any other faction. Here, they can't live with defeat. But a good Republican can live with the victory of a Democrat, and a Democrat can live with the victory of a Republican. That's the big difference. The second aspect is imperial hubris, and that's defining goals that are achievable. One of the important things to know about strategy and warfare is if you want to increase your chances for victory, define victory very narrowly. If you define victory as a oh, global war on terrorism, that you defeat terrorism, I'll give you a clue. You're not going to win. Okay, You're not going to win because it's a tactic, number one. And two, how do you defeat the global war on terror? Show me the path to victory. I dare you. I double dog dare you to show me that. You're not going to be able to. And that's one of the things that uh, was hopeful about when President Obama came into office. We went from talking about it as the global war on terrorism to something I think is a real catchy phrase, overseas contingency operations. Um, how many of you actually heard that phrase? Okay, there's something wrong with you. Um, this is one of the least memorable phrases in American political history, and believe me, we're replete with those. Uh, but the reason behind this, the logic behind President Obama calling it overseas contingency operations is actually quite solid. What he's saying here is that a contingency operation isn't a long-term thing. And he's defining victory down very narrowly to, pre to uh, prevent al-Qaeda from having a safe haven and to present a situation for the Afghans to at least be able to fight their own battles. So if you define it victory that narrowly, you may be able to actually claim it legitimately. With that, I want to leave time um, for questions because I think the value of panels is the interaction between the audience and the panelists and hopefully the interaction among the panelists as well. So with that, I'll conclude and take any questions.
questions? Hello, um, I'm, I'm Nigel, I'm from the Foreign Office, the UK Foreign Office, but I'm asking this in a personal capacity, as we all are. Um, this is one really for the Professor and the Major General. Um, you didn't really, I guess, talk as much about Pakistan's calculations um, as some people might, in terms of rationalising their agenda. I wonder if you could talk a bit about what you would have Pakistan do to counter the militancy that we completely accept is on their borders. You know, what would you have them do regards to the tribal areas, marching, uh, and what are the, uh, con con you know, outcomes that that would lead to. So for you two, thank you. Is this on? Okay. Um, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think, first off, we were both pressed for time and Mark was like starting to draw weapons and threaten us. So, um, no, I think, I think realistically, Pakistan does have a capacity problem. Um, and this is something that we have to understand. Now, they have a capacity problem, but that doesn't mean that they don't have a lot of capacity. It's just to do, to suppress, especially in 2009, for instance, uh, if they had wanted to suppress the entire Pakistani Taliban, they'd have had to draw troops off the Indian border. Um, not necessarily enormous numbers of troops, but they'd have had to draw troops off the Indian border, and the Pakistani army doesn't like to do that. Uh, as far as they were concerned, they did actually draw some regular conventional forces off the Indian border fairly small numbers compared to what was, what was available. Um, Pakistan has pursued some of its militant problems in ways that we should not only be sympathetic to, but should actually applaud. Uh, we talk about the Pakistani Taliban, but the Pakistanis are only at war with a, a limited sector of the Pakistani Taliban. They are fighting perhaps a half a dozen different groups out of the 43 or so that the last time I checked had actually signed up for membership in that organization. And the reason they're doing that is they're fighting the ones that are most dangerous. They're fighting the ones that have not only declared war against Pakistan effectively, but which are actively carrying out operations. Um, that said, they could do a lot more. Uh, and if the first target has to be the Pakistani Taliban, then I certainly would understand that. Uh, again, 43 groups have signed on to an agenda that says we want to overthrow the Pakistani government by force. It would seem to me that that's a reasonable thing to, to go after. Um, I think they could go a long way in dealing with some of their radical problems. Also, by limiting the operations of the Afghan Taliban and other groups out of Pakistani territory. Because by creating a a resistance myth for those groups. And by continuing to provide them with support, they validate those groups and their agenda. And those groups, as we know, have flexible agendas, which may in the future be more aligned with the Pakistani Taliban than with Mullah Omar's current concerns, which are primarily in Kabul and Kandahar and the South. Um, I think there's a lot more that could be done in terms of intelligence cooperation. Um, this is just my guess. I have no, no special inside knowledge, but I strongly suspect that in Pakistani intelligence there are cells that do not talk to one another. There's probably a cell that is titled something like the Office of Supporting the Americans in the War on Terror, and another cell somewhere out of sight uh, that's entitled the Office to Support Mullah Omar in Winning the War on Terror. Um, one of the reasons Pakistan is invaluable in the war on terror and is, uh, remains a critical partner for all of the difficulties in the relationship is that unfortunately they know a lot more about most of these militants, not just their own, but also Al-Qaeda and Al-Qaeda-linked groups and Islamist groups around <coughs> Southeast Asia and South Asia and the Middle East. They know a lot more about it than anybody else because their intelligence organizations cooperate with them much more. So for a start, I, I would not, I think America fixates on the tribal areas. Um, I think it's very difficult for Pakistan to assert authority over the tribal areas. Nobody has. Alexander the Great couldn't. Um, the British Raj couldn't. I mean, these are very, I, there are limits. At the same time, when one, when reporters can find Mullah Omar, when reporters can find the leaders of the Haqqani network, I have no doubt service intelligence also can. And if you want
wanted to really take these people off the streets and keep them off the streets? I think you can. You have to figure out how you want to do it, right? because I think, honestly, if they took on the whole problem at once, it might be too much. It would cause such internal disruption. It may have to be a more sort of systematic and sequential campaign where you target the highest priority first. But I have no doubt there's more that they could do. Yeah, let me uh, add a military perspective to what has just been said. Um, on 26th of August, uh, Operation Tight Screw was to be launched in North Waziristan. And uh, you know the games that the U.S. State Department was, has been playing with the Pakistan Army for a long time in order either to persuade or coerce the Pakistan Army to go for uh, the Miratab. You know, there's North Waziristan and there is South Waziristan. In North Waziristan, uh, there are different groups, and I don't need to go, but it's the Haqqani network in Mirasab. And uh, 26 August came and went, and uh, the U.S. State Department, if you recall, there was this thing about uh, putting the Haqqani network on the giving it the U a terrorist tag and uh, this went on for quite some time and finally uh, the Pakistan army uh, General Kayani uh, did not launch that operation uh, in fact it, he launched no operation our information was that some operations would be launched but not against the the Haqqani group but against uh, the Gul Hafiz or Gul Hafiz group which is also in North Waziristan just to tell the Americans look we are doing something now that's the big picture now the problem with the Pakistan army and I'm not saying this because I'm from the uh, former military officer an army officer from India but we have to understand that the Pakistan army is both not able and not willing to do this. Some reasons uh, Tim has given you about uh, overstretch. They will always tell you that they cannot open another front. Uh, they have a front which they have opened. By the way, they have only launched two major operations, one in Swat and the other in South Waziristan. Um, and this North Waziristan operation tight screw uh, did not come about and I don't believe it will happen that uh, because Haqqanis are their strategic asset as we heard earlier and the Haqqani group is also part of the Quetta Shura and because they are part of the Quetta Shura they are required to confabulate during the reconciliation process so um, the Pakistan army will not allow, uh, will not carry out these operations. Now, I was talking about ability and willingness. Now, Pakistan army has traditionally been a conventional army. They have trained to fight the Indian army. And that is how they have been till about 2005, 2006. But just look at the way they fight their counterinsurgency operations. Their counterinsurgency operations against their own people are launched uh, with uh, jet aircraft, artillery, helicopter strafing, which is fine. But uh, in the the Indian Army has been engaged in counterinsurgency for the last 60 years against its own people, its misguided people but never except once except once on one occasion were aircraft used no artillery no helicopters minimum force force used in good faith for i don't have to go into the details of military war. so the the difference both in the strategy and the tactics that the pakistan army employs ensures nowhere else before the operations are launched, 
there are IDPs, internally displaced people. They ask, population knows that once the staffing starts, they start withdrawing. So you have 200,000 people come out of SWAT, you have 300,000 people come out of South Waziristan, and, 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 and such like. So that, I think, is the, is the reason. And the last point I would mention is the, where India is concerned, and again, they mentioned here that uh, they did pull out. Uh, yes, they pulled out, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, they have a total of 120,000 uh, troops which were uh, at one stage shifted from uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the eastern border to the west. And uh, I do recall that in, in conversations with Pakistan, uh, the government of India, informal conversations, had said that, look, we are prepared to in whatever forum, this is unofficial conversation, uh, give an undertaking that were Pakistani troops to withdraw from the eastern border against India and transfer more troops for operation. Because one of the reasons Pakistani army gives is we don't have enough troops because of the Indian border. Well, that conversation has taken place with India. Indians have mentioned this to the Americans that India will not initiate operations against the Pakistan army on the Eastern Front if they were to pull out troops to engage. But obviously, I, that's why I said, if there, if there is no willingness, so it's all uh, make-believe that, oh no, we, we don't want to open another front because we don't have the resources. I don't believe that is the truth. Next question. I could have answered without the time limit. Yeah. <laughs> without being pressed to answer Actually, such no. a uh, Two minutes, maybe. So you were uh, really good. Yes. Uh, slowly, we are trying to win over more public support, especially for the insurgency. Uh, terrorism, the public is very supportive of that. For the secessionist movement, trying to put up a Southeast Asian pan Islamic caliphate covering Mindanao, parts of the Philippines, Indonesia, and Singapore. Uh, people from Mindanao are very supportive of that. People from the imperial capital, that's what we call people from Metro Manila, they don't seem to give a damn so long as it doesn't reach the shorelines. For the insurgency, like uh, what Professor Mark mentioned earlier, we need to be able to sell to the general public that we need to win the hearts and minds, especially of the people below. Unless we see support, militarily we have done our part. We have reduce their numbers to maybe what 25% of what they originally were. Uh, firearms are down. But that's as far as the military effort goes. Beyond that, in following the clear, whole, consolidate, develop concept, clearing is the military part. Holding is when the security forces come in from the communities. Clear, whole, consolidate is when you put up the pillars or the institutions of local governance for development to come in. We have done our part under clearing. Hold the uh, clear, hold, consult, and develop. We need to see more buy-in from the other stakeholders. But initially, we see some success in getting more public support. Thank you. The um, Pakistani officials will often talk about uh, the uh, Saudi-Iranian proxy war in part to help explain the amount of internal violence against Shia in Pakistan. Um, this has been an ongoing problem since 1984, 1985. Um, it may have something to do with uh, the input of both Iranian intelligence and Saudi GID uh, into Pakistan. Um, both were operating and supporting Mujahideen, different groups. Uh, the Iranians provided support usually from their border, but the Iranians also had a pan-Shia uh, support network 
and there are large Shia minorities in both Pakistan and India. Um, in Pakistan, there are particularly heavy concentrations in the northwest and the north, uh, but there are pockets throughout the country. They are regular targets. If you read about mosques being attacked, often, certainly not all the time, but often the mosques that are being attacked, particularly if they're around Peshawar, are Shia mosques that are being attacked by militant groups, especially lashkar e Jangvi, which is the most well-known. It's been banned by the United States as a foreign terrorist organization for a dozen years. Um, there's an organization called sipa e sahaba uh, Both of these organizations were originally established by Pakistani Inter-Service Intelligence. Both of them have been funded by Pakistani Inter-Service Intelligence. Uh, both of them have been used to attack internal opponents by Pakistani uh, Inter-Service Intelligence. So arguing, therefore, that the problem is a Saudi-Iranian proxy war, it seems to me is a cover for something considerably more complex. The Saudis are have been a problem in Pakistan's internal condition because of Saudi madrasas, because of the import of Salafist ideas and Salafist madrasas into Pakistan. I mean, that has considerably complicated and radicalized uh, Islam in the country. The same is probably true of Iran, although I don't know as much about that. So I would say, yeah, there's some truth to it, but really much of this violence is a much more internal thing that is where, where Pakistan is the agent and, inter and inter-service intelligence is the sort of, uh, the better. Mr. John, do you want to jump in on that? Here. Oh, okay. Um, I just touch on that, that you find that with the Saudis that they are very specific in who they send money to in which groups in Pakistan that ironically even though that they were one of the principal backers of the Taliban especially with the fact that the Taliban were Diobandi the Pakistanis don't get money from the Saudis for their Diobandi groups so like uh, Jaishi Muhammad, the Harkut al Mujahideen don't get money but groups like the Lashkar e Toiba which is Ali Hadith which is basically South Asian Salafism they are very open to receiving money from the Gulf. They get a lot of it. And as Tim had mentioned, groups like Alaskari Jangvi and Sifai Saba, they also, being sectarian, get a lot of money from the Gulf. Um, the place to look to see where really these little conflicts and uh, proxy battles are taking place is Karachi. I mean, that is probably one of the most happening cities in the world. You've got Baluchis, Pashtuns, Mojiyas, Shias, Sunnis basically killing each other on the streets. It's the home to elements of the Taliban, to Al-Qaeda, to the Lashkari Toiba. All these different factions are there. I mean, one of the questions earlier was about Pakistan's military doing an operation in the tribal areas. They should be more concerned about doing an operation in Karachi because that has become a real cesspool now for all kinds of extremisms and proxies and unfortunately, if, we, if they can't solve a major urban city uh, turning into a battleground, they're not going to be able to fix any tribal problems either.
first thing to understand is that in Pakistan, the nuclear weapons are the crown jewels. They are the single most important symbol of Pakistan as a great nation. And they are the last thing that will go. They are completely under the control of the army. There is, uh, technically, there are organizations and boards which are supposed to authorize their procurement and in a crisis their use. And in theory, there are civilians on those panels. Uh, I do not know of anyone who believes that a civilian will actually have a significant vote on those boards unless they are a scientist. The army owns the weapons, they control the weapons, they police the weapons, they protect the weapons. And as a result, one often hears that these weapons should therefore be very safe. Now, the general uh, began to give the counter argument, and if you really want to give the counter argument, pardon my language, I did not title the article. There is an article in The Atlantic from December of 2011 called Pakistan the Ally from Hell. Um, it is quite detailed and it looks at Pakistan's nuclear security apparatus and practice. And what it claims, um, it, is, it has multiple sources for most of the claims, but they are not identified because the information is so secret. What it claims is that Pakistan moves nuclear weapons control components around the country in unmarked civilian vehicles with no protection. Okay? Uh, that's a stark claim. Um, it suggests a very different attitude towards nuclear security than the United States or the Soviet Union or France or Britain had. I can't speak for any other country. Um, but it also suggests some level of vulnerability. A again, as the general pointed out, whether these have been serious attacks or not, on at least a half a dozen occasions, there have, there have been gunfights between militant groups and Pakistani security forces near military bases where it is rumored that nuclear components may or may not be stored. If that were to happen in the United States, if, that were to if there were a gunfight outside Demona in Israel, pardon my speaking frankly, or if it were to happen outside a major military base in the United States, you know that there would be an immediate response from the government, that things would fundamentally change because something so important had been threatened. What's disturbing in Pakistan is that we don't see evidence of that change. Now, so that suggests that security, even if it's not an epic problem, is a problem. Um, in terms of maintaining the weapons, at the moment, most of these weapons are, have been built fairly recently. Uh, uranium weapons, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm a political scientist, not a, not a nuclear engineer, to the best of my knowledge, uranium weapons, which is the bulk of the Pakistani arsenal, are reasonably easy to keep up and because they're reasonably new weapons, most of them have been built in the last 10 years. There should not be significant erosion in terms of the, the weapons themselves. Um, again, I think the Pakistanis are going to continue to deploy enormous resources to keep that particular asset stable and healthy, uh, even if the rest of the country declines in ugly ways, because it's, it's just too important for them. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, we've, uh, uh, last 10 years, we meet once a year at least, uh, military officers from India and Pakistan uh, and one of the things we are talking about is the safety and security of the nuclear arsenal. And on one occasion, uh, we met a brigadier uh, who was uh, intimately involved in, in, with their sec uh, security policy group and the, uh, the layers of security uh, that uh, protect, physical protection of uh, the nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapons are dispersed, so you will have a nuclear uh, core, that is, uh, then you will have a trigger device, and then you will have a delivery system. So you won't find all three together. But having said that, the fact is, that these gentlemen who we talked to have assured us 
that their levels of screening, uh, these six, six or 7,000 uh, soldiers or personnel who are involved in the three, three layers of security that protect the arsenal are almost, uh, they're, they're, they're very safe and uh, there's nothing to worry about. Uh, but as Indians and as, uh, as concerned people, uh, we have seen these attacks take place at the naval base, uh, at the Air Force base, not once but four times as I mentioned, at the general headquarters in, uh, in Rawalpindi, uh, against the ISI, and all these attacks have taken place with insider collusion. So it, this, so none of this this uh, uh, weapon uh, falling into the hands of uh, uh, a terrorist group is not going to happen that easily. But the fact is that now Pakistan has gone on to make what they call a tactical nuclear weapon. Uh, that is the latest addition to the arsenal. And tactical nuclear weapons, simply because of the decentralization, are even more vulnerable to fall into the hands of these uh, terrorist groups. And uh, I think what happens is that uh, I, I have a quote here, which I, uh, two months ago I presented a paper in London, and I I thought I might just read this out to you on this nuclear threat. In March this year, U.S. Under Secretary of Defense Policy James Miller said in a written answer submitted to the Sen Senate Armed Services Committee that support by elements of Pakistan's military and intelligence services for violent extremist organizations targeting India has the potential to res result in military confrontation that could rapidly escalate to a nuclear exchange. Now, this, of course, is a different matter that I am talking about. Hafiz Saeed, whose name has been mentioned here, who is the mentor of the lashkar e taiba and Jamaatul Dawa, has on more than one occasion said that Pakistan should use its nuclear weapons against India to settle the water dispute. So here you have, uh, you, somebody had mentioned earlier the Defense uh, Council uh, of Pakistan, Pakistan's Defense Council, which has all these terrorist leaders of terrorist groups who meet uh, publicly in Lahore and which also includes the Hezbul Mujahideen uh, Salah, leader Salahuddin, so and and uh, Pakistani retired officers on this group, and they are openly saying that we have these nuclear weapons, we should use these against India. So the threat is uh, is there.
Yeah. One thing, just quickly, is that you have to remember that Pakistan is different to Afghanistan. Pakistan was created as a democracy. It has civil society movements, but over time the military has systematically eroded them. The judiciary has been politicized. The media gets muzzled. Lawyers and journalists are getting killed. They have to be empowered. One of the basic problems currently in Pakistan is a lack of electricity. They're having power shortages by the day. Uh, basic food staples like onions and flour, which for us may seem trivial, is very important to them, and the prices are going up all the time. The problem is that then the handouts, the assistance, the welfare comes from the extremists. Now, the civil society movement in Pakistan is there. It can be enhanced, but they need to be supported above the military. Quite far too often, I think, a Western solution is we see these guys in uniform, we give them money, we think they'll provide the solution. Actually, they do the opposite. And Musharraf, who was the military ruler from 99 to 2007, this is his legacy very much now. And what we're seeing is this, this Islamic country, which is a democracy, actually being undermined from within. And I think that's really sad. Thank you very much.